See, cars, now cars, cars aren't that reliable, especially the cars of yours, uh, but neither are horses. Uh, and, and at least with cars, it isn't personal. Horses have complex psychologies. They, they have itty-bitty brains. Uh, horses are like your adolescent children. Cars, cars are like your computer, you know? Now, the computer may be bulky, it may be slow, it may even be worthless, but it never dresses itself in all black, gets every part of its keyboard pierced, screams that you just don't understand, and goes out and takes drugs and is brought home by the police at 3 in the morning. You know, it doesn't. Actually, horses don't do that either, but you, you understand what I'm saying. You know? Changing a tire on a car is no fun, but it's easier than shoeing a horse, and you won't get kicked or bitten or have manure dumped on your head while you're changing a tire unless you change it in a very bad neighborhood. Um, you can take a car and put it in a dark, cramped, ill-ventilated space and leave it there for months, and the, and the ASPCA will not get on your case, you know? I mean, for that matter, you can, you can beat a car in the street, you know, without raising any public protest as long as you own the car that you're beating. Uh, even when OPEC is doing its worst, cars are more efficient to fuel than horses are, although a roll in the hay is preferable to a roll in the petroleum. Uh, and, and anyone, anyone who thinks that cars add to greenhouse gases and horses do not has not spent enough time behind a horse, you know? For the purpose of ennobling us schlubs, the car is just better than the horse in every way, you know? I mean, it costs less, it's more convenient, we don't get kicked and smelly, and it is much easier to drive than it is to ride. Now, I speak with some feeling on this subject because I took up horseback riding. I took up horseback riding when I was almost 60. On the other hand, I began to drive. When I began to drive, I was so small that when I was driving, my cousin Tommy had to lie on the transmission hump and operate the accelerator to brake with his hands because I couldn't reach him with my feet. You know? All the grown-ups, after all the grown-ups had gone to bed, Tommy and I, we, we, we shifted the Buick into neutral. This very car, as a matter of fact, or one very like it, pushed it down the driveway, you know, out of earshot, fired up the engine, and we toured the neighborhood, you know. Now, comparatively speaking, the difficulty of horsemanship versus driving can, can be illustrated by what happened to Tommy and me next, which was nothing, nothing. We maneuvered the car home, we turned it off, we rolled it back up the driveway. We were raised in the blessedly flat Midwest, so that was easy to do. And during our foray, the Buick speedometer reached, maybe it reached 30 miles an hour. But 30 miles an hour is a full out gallop on a horse. And for those of you who don't ride horses, forget everything you've seen about horseback riding in the movies. Forget everything you've seen on TV. Possibly a little kid who had never been on a horse could ride a horse at a full gallop without killing himself. And possibly one of the Jonas brothers could land an F-14 on a carrier deck. <laughs> so cars, this is why cars took the place of horses in our hearts. You know? Once we had caught a glimpse of a well-turned Goodyear and checked out the curves of the bodywork and the fenders, well, the old gray mare, she just was not what she used to be. You know? And we embarked upon life in the fast lane with our new paramour. It was a great love story of man and machine. The road to the future was paved with bliss. And then we got married and moved to the suburbs. You know? Now, see, being away from the central cities meant Americans had to spend more of their time driving. And over the years, our away got farther and farther away. And eventually, this meant that Americans had to spend all of their time driving. I mean, the play date was 40 miles from the Chuck E. Cheese. The swim meet was 40 miles from the cello lesson. You know, the Montessori was 40 miles from the math coach. The dad's job was 40 miles from mom's job. And both their jobs were 40 miles from the three-car garage. And, you know, the car ceased to be object of desire and equipment for adventure. And it turned into office and rec room and communication sub and breakfast nook and recycling bin. A motorized cup holder is what the modern car has become. Americans, the richest people on earth, were stuck in the confines of their crossover SUVs, squeezed into less space than, than tech support call center employees at a Mumbai cubicle farm, you know what I mean? We became sick of our cars, tired of our cars, we even became angry at our cars. 
and, 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 and the pointy-headed, now the pointy-headed busybodies of the environmentalist, new urbanist, utopian, communitarian ilk, <laughs> they blamed the victim. They blamed the victim. They claimed it was the car. The car had forced us to live in widely scattered settlements in a wilderness of big box stores in the Olive Garden. You know? Now if we would all just get on our segways or hop on a trolley, they said America could become an archipelago of cozy gulags on the Portland, Oregon model, you know, with everyone nestled together in the most sustainably carbon neutral, diverse, and ecologically unimpactful way, you know. But cars didn't do this to us. Cars didn't shape our existence. Cars let us escape with our lives. You know, we are way the heck, we are living way the heck out there in valley bottom heights and trout antler estates because we were at war with the cities. We fought rotten public schools, idiot municipal bureaucracies, corrupt political machines, rampant criminality, and all the pointy-headed busybodies, you know? And cars, in this battle, cars gave us our dragoons, our hussars. They lent us speed and mobility. They let us scout the terrain and probe the enemy's lines. And thanks to our cars, when we lost the cities, we were not forced to surrender. We were able to retreat. But our poor cars paid the price. They, they, they were flashing swords beaten into dull plowshares. Cars became appliances. Or worse than appliances. I mean, nobody's ticked off at the dryer or the dishwasher, you know, much less at the fridge. I mean, we all recognize these as labor-saving devices. The car, on the other hand, it seems to create labor. We hold the car responsible for all the dreary errands to which it needs to be steered. And we're thinking, hell, a golf cart's more fun. You know, you can ride around in a golf cart with a six-pack, safe from the breathalyzers, you know, chasing Canada grease on the fairways and taking swings at the golfers with a nine-iron, you know. I mean, we lost our love for cars, and, and we forgot our debt to cars. And meanwhile, the pointy-headed busybodies have been exacting their revenge. You see, we escaped the poke of their nose once when we lived downtown, but we will not be able to peel out so fast this time because in the name of safety and emissions control and fuel economy and global warming and all the rest of it, the, the, the simple mechanical eloquence, elegance, of the automobile. It has been rendered ponderous, cumbersome, incomprehensible. You might as well pry the back off an iPod as pop the hood on a contemporary motor vehicle. Huh? Aging shade tree mechanic like myself, I look in there and I just sit back down in the shade. You know? <laughs> or I would if the car weren't squawking at me like rehearsal for a divorce. You know? Bzz, you left the key in, bzz, you left the door open, bzz, you left the lights on, bzz, you left your dirty socks in the middle of the bedroom floor. It's like, it drives me crazy. You know? See, I don't believe the pointy heads give a damn about climate change or gas mileage, much less about whether I survive a head-on with one of their tax-sucking mass transit projects. You know, All they want to do is make sure I hate my car, you know? Because how proud and handsome would, say, Rachel Alexandra, how proud and handsome would that horse look with a seat and shoulder belts, with airbags, five-mile-an-hour bumpers, and a maze of pollution control equipment uh, 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 under her tail, you know? Uh, uh, and that's it. That was it. That was the end of the American automobile industry. Because, you know, when it comes to dull, practical, ugly things that bore and annoy me, Japanese things cost less, you know, and the cup holders are more conveniently located, you know. Now, I myself, I got something old school under, under a tarp down in my basement garage. And, but I bet that after my will has been probated, some child of mine will yank the dust cover and use the proceeds of the eBay, eBay sale, you know, to buy a mountain bike. Four things greater than all things are, and I'm pretty sure bicycles aren't one of them, you know. Now, there are those of us who have had the good fortune to meet with strength and beauty, with majestic force in which we were willing to trust our lives, and then a day comes that strength and beauty fails, and a man does what a man has got to do, and I'm going to go downstairs and put a bullet in a V8. Anyway, thank you very much. That is everything I know about cars. Um,